are listening to episode 167 of the Tennis Files podcast on the secrets to a world-class serve. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Tennis Files podcast. My name is Mirban Aranshad, a former Division I college tennis player. And on the show, I interview the world's top pros, coaches, and experts to help you improve your tennis game. And today I have a conglomeration, if you will, of an episode featuring some of the most powerful serve advice ever given on the Tennis Files podcast from several legendary coaches and players. And these individuals are as follows. Dr. Mark Kovacs, uh, Rick Macy, Johan Creek, Taylor Dent, Greg Lesur, and there's also some guy named Mirabon (laughs) Ranshad. And all of these people are featured on the podcast. Uh, I scoured my archives to find the best serve advice that I could and bring them to you on this episode. For you devout Tennis Files podcast listeners, you may have listened to some episodes where I've kind of grouped together the best advice that I've gotten on certain topics. And I realized that I hadn't done one on the serve yet. And so I find that these episodes are very useful because they're obviously very targeted and they bring together some really great advice from these individuals. Um, So uh, Dr. Mark Kovacs is uh, one of the top sports performance specialists in the world, and he's worked with so many great players. John Isner comes to mind, and you've got Rick Macy, who's one of the most legendary coaches, you know, in the world. He's, He's worked with so many great players, including the Williams sisters. Uh, You've got Johan Creek, who is a former Grand Slam champion. And then we've got Taylor Dent, who was a top American player and now has his own coaching academy. And you've got Greg Lesur from Online Tennis Instruction, who was also a great player as well, playing um, some pro tournaments. So uh, and then you've got me, who's interviewed all these people and you know play at the 5 level and have just learned from, uh, wow, you know, almost 170 episodes now. We're at 167. But Um, you know, I want to cap off this intro at this point, but I just want to get these inter, these, um, you know, clips of all these great pieces of serve advice from these, uh, great individuals plus myself (laughs) on the show. So let's get straight to it. So without further ado, here are, uh, the greatest pieces of advice on how to build a world-class tennis serve from some great guests. So here we go. Fantastic, Mar. I really appreciate it. And I think uh, it's going to be really a, a lot of fun uh, talking about the serve today because you know, you've uh, pretty much crafted and, and written also an extensive paper on breaking down the serve into a basically eight stage model. So I kind of want to just start off with, you know, asking you to kind of just uh, in brief to describe, you know, basically what the, the eight stage model is. Sure. So yeah, this came about, you know, five, six years ago now. Uh, we were doing a lot of work analyzing the best servers of all time uh, and trying to find those commonalities. And there are some. Uh, and we really utilized our work in baseball as well. So utilizing what's been done in the baseball pitching mechanics literature uh, and then also in the tennis specific literature. And the objective here is really to get a simplified way of understanding what all good servers go through. And really, the eight stages were the eight important, most important components of the service motion. And it really is pretty simple. You have a start component that has a lot to do with the style of the athlete. A lot of athletes start differently. Then you have a ball release. So when the ball comes out of the hand, there's a lot that goes on there. And that's a really important stage for nearly all players to make sure that's done correctly. Then we have a loading stage, which is really the lower body loading which is really, really important to make sure the legs get utilized the correct way in the correct pattern. Uh, Then we get into what's called the cocking stage, which comes from the baseball literature as well. It's the max external rotation of your upper arm. And it's really the last point that you're storing energy in the upper body. So you've already transitioned from the lower body into the upper body. Then you have acceleration, where acceleration is really you start going up into the ball, Uh, Then you have contact, which is pretty important, or impact, it's sometimes called. A very short stage, but very important, because that's really the whole purpose of the serve, is to get the racket to make contact with the ball. Uh, And then we have the deceleration stage, and this is really, really important for a number of reasons. 
uh, because this is where a lot of the potential injuries happen and where the forces are really high on trying to slow down the arm. Uh, and then we have the finish, which is really the end of the serve, but it's really the beginning of the next stroke because what we need to do at the finish is stabilize our body, make sure that we can recover quickly to be able to hit the next ball. Yeah, I mean, that that's very comprehensive. And I guess kind of just starting with, you know, the very first uh, stage, uh, the, the start of preparation, um, can you talk through kind of like the different types of, uh, you know, ways that we can, uh, we can start the whole motion and, and if there's one that's preferred or if, you know, the, there's many different ones that we can use that are equally effective? Yeah, no, it's really a, an interesting discussion point because uh, at the COVAX Institute, we run a course, a uh, surf-specific course. And one of the things that's interesting is when we speak to great coaches, a lot of them have certain ways they like their players to start. Uh, a lot of the time, there's no real justification for it. It's just something they like. So you know, one of the things with the start, it's all stylistic. So we've seen, you know, from Goran Ivanisevic to Pete Sampras to Serena Williams to Roger Federer to John Isner, they all start a little bit differently. Their feet position, uh, some are wide, some are close. The hip positions are a little bit different. So the, the start is truly a stylistic aspect of the service motion. And a lot of the things we want to make sure is we don't over or force the athlete into a start position that's not comfortable for them. But, you know, there's a lot of different variations we can do there. So usually we don't worry too much about the start unless there's a problem later in the motion. And then if there is, then we go back to the start and maybe readjust. But in general, it's do what feels right to the best of your ability to allow the next stages of the serve to happen. Gotcha, Mark. That's a great point there. And I'm just wondering if, if you know, obviously there's many different ones, but is there one that is most commonly used? And, and also as a follow-up, I mean, you know, I, I'm trying to think, say, I ha- had some coach who told me that it's, it facilitates the whole movement if you actually start the arms up because then it, you know, drops and lets the whole thing flow versus kind of starting uh, where your arms are kind of uh potentially maybe more tight or tense. Uh, so any thoughts on, on all that? Yeah, again, it's got, it's got a lot to do with timing, rhythm, what people like to do. But um, yeah, but there really isn't. And again, we try to base everything we do off the evidence and what really links to the most important components of the serve. So, you know, there are people that really like to start with their arms low, really relaxed, have a longer type of wind up. Uh, which is totally fine. Then there are other people that start very close with their arms higher and really get into the motion, the real meat and potatoes of the motion much faster. Again, there's fast motions, there's slow motions that can both be successful. So a lot of it has to do to with what the next stage is in the motion. So to, to me, the important part is how are they when they get into their loading stage? They get to their loading stage correctly, then the start doesn't matter. It's working, whatever they're doing. So a lot of the time, unless you're talking about a true beginner, the start is not really something you you need to teach. You need to make sure you understand it, but you really need to understand the release stage, which is next, and then the loading stage. They're the two most important from a standpoint of getting the mechanics correct. Got you, Mark. Perfect. Thanks so much for that. And so now talking about the release, um, kind of want to get into the specifics of the mechanics because that, that, you know, from what I'm reading is, is this basically when the, the, the toss uh, goes up and um, y- y- there is some, uh, uh, nomenclature here, which maybe for the audience, we can uh, clarify. Basically, it's saying that, um, you know, the muscle activation is very limited in the left uh, erector spinae. Uh, I'm probably pronouncing this horribly um, during the start and release stages. So could you kind of uh, talk about what exactly that means and in general, what the release stage look like? Sure. So, yeah, I think you're reading from uh, one of our peer reviewed publications that I did with uh, Todd Allenbecker. Uh, And again, that was designed more for physical therapists, medical doctors, chiropractors, people that sort of work with tennis athletes and understand the, all the anatomy. So we were just talking about what aspects of the anatomy uh, are important during the motions. So from that standpoint, it's not necessarily something that needs to be understood for a coach or for an athlete. The real purpose is there isn't a lot of muscle activation that's going on during the release. Really what's happening is our, for a right-hander, our left arm is releasing the ball 
Usually you have it in an angle like this. So we want to have a little bit of a range. So the ball is going to be released somewhere. The arm angle is somewhere at about one to two o'clock. So if 12 o'clock straight, it's off in, in that area. So we see a lot of people have trouble where they release straight on. So it's straight out in front of them. And when they do that, they shift their weight forward too early usually. And secondarily, they can't really get effective hip turn. So that's the two biggest things that we see uh, players struggle with with the release. The other aspect with the release that we know, we analyze hundreds of servers to see where the ball actually came out of their hands. And we know that all good servers release the ball in a very small area, meaning that the ball comes out about eye level or to the top of the head. So it's only about that much distance that the ball is actually released. If you release the ball too low, the ball goes out in front of you and you're always chasing your toss. If you release the ball too high from the hand, it means the ball goes over your head or goes to your left for a right-handed server. So we know we have to have a very defined area of space that we actually release the ball from the fingertips. And that's a really, really important concept for most servers to focus on because it does give you a sense of where to release and how to release. And then it makes sure that you don't have a toss that gets too far out in front of you or too far behind you. Fantastic, Mark. So a couple of clarifying questions. One is, um, you know, when you analyze all the servers, so is there at least some degree of, uh, of the arm being bent then? There's this, are there a few that actually have the arm very all oh, fully straight when they toss then? Yeah, so again, there's, there are some players that have slightly bent arms when they release. Majority of them are straighter. The recommendation for most players is to keep the arm straight. There's less chance of flipping the ball. There's less movement at the elbow. There's no movement really at the elbow. And that takes out variability and that takes out chance of risk. So again, it's one of those things with players, we want to minimize the chance of making an error. And by having a bent elbow or having an arm bent, you've got the ability then to flick the ball. Same with the wrist. If we have wrist moves a lot, We've got the ability to flick the ball, which is just another area that we may do something that we don't want to do. So in general, we want from the shoulder to the fingers to be straight the entire way. And then the ball just comes out of the fingers. So our goal with all of this is to minimize wasted movement minimize the chance of some part of the body causing a problem. Great, Mark. And also with the um, getting to the weeds of the toss also, you know, the position of the palm, I'm curious too. Um, you know, I've, I've seen players, you know, with the palm up, I've seen some that actually hold the ball like, uh, I guess, a cup or an ice cream, cream cone, which has been suggested to me before to help with the toss. And even some players that have the palm pretty much down. So I'm curious, uh, any data regarding that? So it's a great question. And again, a bit of that is style. If you want to go palm down, which is a little harder, some very few people do it, but there is a palm down version. There's, like you said, the beer can, ice cream can kind of release, which is to the side, or you've got the more traditional, which is the palm up. And in general, you know, any of them can work as long as the ball gets in the right spot consistently. So that's a bit of a style issue. Uh, in in general, it's more consistent over a large number of people with the palm up version. But again, if you're comfortable doing a, you know, the, the can version or the ice cream version or even the palm down, it's one of those things where if you get the ball consistently in the right spot, it's working because that's really the objective. We don't want to, you know, cause an issue with someone who serves fine or gets the ball in the right spot consistently uh, by changing that position. There's no need to do that. But in general, if you're having all sorts of problems with your toss, you may want to adjust how you release the ball but there's other factors that, that are going to be more important from that standpoint. All right. Great stuff, Mark. I think two of the biggest takeaways are pretty much um, if you do want to minimize any variability, uh, straight arm and also uh, kind of releasing it at eye level. And uh, one last question for the toss is um, as far as looking at the ball, do you do you look at the, you know, start looking at the ball once it, it gets to eye level? Because, uh, you know, obviously you, what you could do is just look at the ball, you know, from it being in your hand as well. So I was just wondering if there's any, uh, any thoughts about that as well. Yeah, no, it's one of those things. The biggest thing is you do at, you know, when you're getting into your load, 
you want to be looking up. How you get there is somewhat stylistic. Again, you know, some people will follow the ball from the beginning all the way and they'll look at the ball the entire time. Other people won't look at the ball at all until it's up in the air. So it's one of those aspects of maybe, you know, I like to a lot of the time say, even though I analyze the serve in, in great detail down to the millisecond of movement, most of the time I'd say in this situation, don't overthink that piece of it because you can really get yourself in trouble if you're overthinking too many parts of the motion. Let me overthink it. And then as a player, you know, or, or even as a coach sometimes, keep it simple and focus on the things that really matter. Exactly. Mark, appreciate that advice very much. And so now we get to the loading phase, which is uh, just incredibly important. And you see, you know, a lot of um, mistakes being made here. And uh, just kind of want to talk to you or ask you about really the, the critical elements of a, of a good load for the serve. Yeah, so loading's the most important stage from a lower body perspective. If the load isn't done correctly, the rest of the service motion will never be perfect. You can make up for some areas in the upper body, but if the load's not done right, what we typically see is the lower back is uh, puts more strain, the abs, we put more strain, and then, of course, the shoulder and elbow starts doing more work than they need to. So it's really, really important to have a great load. The couple of things that you need to remember is making sure that you get two big aspects involved. The back leg needs to load, so we need to push down and back on the back leg, and we need to get a twist rotation of the hip. So for a right-hander, the right leg goes down and back, and then the right hip turns a little bit so that it'll actually turn somewhat clockwise for a right-handed player. So the real purpose behind all this is we have to go back to high school physics and talking about for every action, we have an equal and opposite reaction. That concept is related to the serve because when we're serving, we're trying to get our body weight to go up and out into the court. Uh, and to do that effectively, we have to drop our weight during loading back and down. So this is a really, really important aspect of the serve that we understand the motion aspect so that we store our energy correctly so that we can release it in the right direction. And most players screw that up. That's really where we see the majority of players screw up. They shift their weight too far forward too early, so their front leg does most of the work. Back leg's not engaged. If the back leg isn't engaged well, you, you leave miles per hour on the table. So it's really, really important to make sure that you uh, understand the importance of the back leg, the importance of not shifting your weight too far forward. Because if you do that, what happens is you usually over-rotate, meaning that your shoulders over-rotate and they become parallel to the net too early in the motion. And by doing that, we really limit our ability to hit different types of serves. And then our upper body does more work than our lower body, which increases our injury risk potentially, uh, but also uh, zaps us of potential power. So there's a lot of factors there that can really limit your serve if your lower body isn't done correctly. All right. I hope you enjoyed that clip from Dr. Mark Kovacs um, on the HCH model of the serve. Some really great advice there. Really enjoyed that talk with Dr. Kovacs and I hope to have him on in the future for sure and definitely on my tennis summits moving forward. So um, now we're going to go to the great Rick Macy. So let's roll that clip for you. Uh, Rick, you know, I feel like the serve is just the this, this stroke that people struggle with the most it, it, from what I've seen. And can you can you kind of explain like why? I, I don't know if you have the same view, but why is the, the serve such a complex stroke that so many people uh, struggle with? It's interesting because um, just through all my experiences and, you know, being around a lot of biomechanists and, you know, people through my career and, you know, studied this stuff and looked at, uh, you know, millions of video at four frames a second, the serve is the easiest thing to teach, uh, even though it's the most complicated because there's no movement. You know, it's like hitting a golf ball, except obviously the ball's not stationary. But since there's no movement, there's a lot of things that are easier to pull off uh, with the serve. But the reason why it's more complicated, 99%, I'd say, people don't understand the serve. And when I say that, I even mean world-class athletes, coaches, um, and all levels. They don't understand the science behind 
the serve. Uh, now it's complicated because you got the left side of your body doing something and the right side, and there's a lot of moving parts uh, going in a lot of different directions, and it requires a little more coordination. So that's why it's problematic for the club player. The club player doesn't even have the right grip half the time. So if you're talking even at the world class level, and I did a study of this, okay, over 95% of the women on the tour biomechanically the serve is incorrect. But if you do millions of anything, you're going to perfect something pretty decent. All right. So that being said, the science behind the serve is, and I mentioned this earlier, leg drive initiates racket speed. There's an optimal time when the racket should be going in and the leg should be going up. This is called counterintuitive. When one thing is going one way, the other is going the other way. So the science is the legs are supposed to drive the racket down into the lower part of the back area, if you want to call it that, or it just goes into that area. But most people enter that area anywhere from 10 to 100% too soon. They don't put the racket not only in the right place, okay, but they drive the legs at the wrong time. And the human eye can't see this. And I had to work, I worked a lot with all the players at player development uh, when the USTA was at Everett, and almost everybody was wrong. Even Riley Opopka, who I spent a lot of time with, who's now seven feet tall. Um, it, it's a, it's amazing because you can still do it wrong and still get a lot out of it. But, and it's kind of hard to explain in this interview exactly what I'm talking about. Um, but the racket, you're, you're preparing to hit the ball, the racket to the outside, you know, whether you're you're starting to drive your legs when the racket's like, say, Sampras or Kyrgios or Roddick or Songa, they drive it when the racket's a little more to the right, okay, the legs start coming up and it pulls the racket in, or the racket's up like Tim or Fetter a little bit, that's an op, That's a good way to do it also, but when you do it like Sampras, Songa, Roddick, people like that, the forearm will rotate actually from my research, about 90% 90 degrees more and you'll get more power spin, but I don't want to get too off track from your question, but the, the number one culprit is people drive the legs at the wrong time, and people, use your legs more, use your legs more, and they keep making the problem worse because the racket's already in too soon, and once I explain this at a seminar or convention over and over again, people understand it. But you, you got to, the, the human eye can't see it, even though I have a human eye, but <laughs> the human eye can't see this. It happens too quick and you can do it wrong and still get away with it. And there's a lot of guys on the tour that are flawless. And there's a handful of girls that are. Um, and then on the second serve, it's brutal because most everybody leaks and puts the racket in way too soon because they don't want to double fault. So the timing of the legs and the racket are all wrong, but you can still pull it off. But so, but that's really in a nutshell shell and I covered a lot of real estate there and that's why I've been fortunate you know uh, to have a lot of people no matter what level they got to everybody if they listen and they put in the homework uh, I can get them a, a great serve no doubt wow Rick that is uh, fantastic stuff I'm personally gonna rewind this a few minutes and uh, listen to that a few times that, that was great stuff appreciate it and uh, as far as what you just mentioned you know the timing of the legs and, and the throwing is there maybe one drill that you might suggest us to do is maybe a simple drill to kind of just help nail that in a little better? Well, what I do is I put the people on probation. I put the racket up at a 90 degree angle. I put my racket next to their racket so they can't move it. I have them toss, bend, and tilt, and they start to jump first or drive the legs first, and then I let go of the racket so it shoots the body up into a dynamic cartwheel, and I can actually feel their racket pressing against my racket because everybody wants to leak the racket. So at the end of the day that I do that more than anything and everybody serves better with my racket on their racket. How crazy is that? I mean, I have so many th- people, people just freak out and the parents freak out and they video this stuff. Hey, everybody, they just, it's like everybody's freaking out about this and they're going, uh, because it's, it, I, I make it happen for free and free is good. And it shoots the body up into this, you know, vertical c- um, position. And like I said, they go into the, the dynamic cartwheel a lot more explosively. And they all say the same thing. I go, were you higher off the ground? Yes. Did you reach up more? Yes. Did the ball go over the net higher? Yes. Did I tell you to do any of those things? No. Wow. See, they all happen for free. And I don't even tell people to, to bend their knees um, uh, if, unless they don't bend their knees, obviously. And I actually reverse engineer it. Sometimes I have, and I can't put this in an article, so I don't want people to start throwing darts at me because <laughs> they need to come and watch me teach because I that's why I couldn't write it. See, uh, mo- you don't try to jump. Your legs drive and it comes. you come off the ground and we call it a jump. But sometimes if you think about it, how many people have you had that you've taught in your lifetime that jump too soon? None. Okay. Everybody drives your legs too late because no one understands the theory. I have people jump too soon and they still can't do it. 
I have them jump on purpose, like they're playing volleyball, okay, spiking a volleyball, and they all serve better. Because what it does, it makes the racket more dormant, so they're not, their racket's not all over, you know, Palm Beach County down here, and the legs drive the racket, and it's a pulling action. It's not just, you know, total spaghetti, out of control arm thing. Don't get me wrong, the arm is loose, and you're free, and all that stuff, but the legs drive the racket. That's why you see a lot of the guys serve look different than the women serve. Not that they're, the women's serves are bad, I'm not saying that, but they look different. They're shorter, they're more compact, they're more co- organized, and it's like a karate move. So it's a whole different concept because the guys have a tendency to do it a little different. Maybe they threw a ball as a youngster different, where the leg, hip, and shoulder were synchronized, whatever. But the problem is your arm is twice as long, got a racket in your hand, everybody overcooks it extra crispy, the racket goes down the back too soon on the other side of the head, and it's just, it's just there's just some uh, a minutia of problems that occur on the serve, um, and you know, if they went at it from a biomechanical point of view and you really understood what should happen. But what most people do is they say, use your legs more, jump more, reach up more, you know, keep your head up. Those are all good tips, but all vanilla and they're a symptom because no one really understands uh, the real culprit. Some really great gold nuggets there from great coach Rick Macy. And I hope you enjoy that one. And now we're going to go to some fantastic serve advice as well from Grand Slam champion Johan Creek. So let's roll that one. Wondering, you know, obviously you mentioned that you can really ramp up uh, your serve if you want to with, you know, for example, 24 aces. How would you describe your serving style? Was it, were you more of a power server or were you just, you know, placing all those, you know, aces in the corners or what do you, how, how do you describe that? I had very good technique on my serve and I think I could disguise it very well because I would hit the ball pretty much at the top of my toss. So it was a fairly quick action and uh, I had very clean technique. So I could just, you know, with a flick of my wrist, change directions at the last second. And, uh, and that's kind of Kind of like how Federer does it, you know, he's not the biggest server in the game, but he's very accurate. So if I was very accurate, uh, then I served really well. And, you know, if you serve well, everything else improves, you know, <laughs> everything gets easier, you know, you get an easier return. So that means you can volley easier. It means that you can perhaps let it land and hit a winner or a drop shot or something. So uh, when when you start building your points around, when you serve at least uh, on your accuracy and your speed, I think I had pretty decent speed. I served probably in the 125 mile an hour range, most of my top career. But those were funky rackets to serve that big, but then was was pretty amazing but there were guys that served 140 145 miles an hour even with wood rackets so um the guys serve big today because the rackets are so much better and so better made and balance wise but um there were some guys that served big when i played nice you and just out of my uh sheer curiosity did you have to make any sort of uh technical changes as you went through the different types of rackets that you played with i think it was inevitable that things would change because when i went from uh from my wood rackets to the Redhead, uh, which was made in Kennelbach, Austria. I, I happened to live very, very close to there when I was 17, 18, 19 years old. So I became a head player. You know, I think because of the way that that racket was very rigid and uh, didn't have much flexibility. Uh, and then later on, I played with Rosignol rackets, which was a composite racket, was a foam injected uh, plates of uh, of aluminum, and then I stuck it into a machine, and then they crimped it together with foam inside. I mean, it's like a French, you know. Citroen car, you know, it's a bizarre car, but it still works well. But uh, so that's how we, we, you know, so you, you, your game really morphed as the technology developed. And so you would swing maybe a little differently because maybe the racket was more head heavy or was more flexible. So you, you adjust as you need it. And, uh, you know, we played with rackets that were made for us and not, we didn't tell them how to make it like, you know, it's not like Federer can walk into Wilson and says, hey, you know, I want an all flat black and I want a little bit more graphite here and a little bit more stiff there, you know, so these rackets are custom design. There was nothing like that really back in our day, frankly. Yeah, I think they should make one for you, you know, maybe uh, Wilson or Dunlop or somebody. Um, but well, yeah. I, had, I had my own Rosigmore racket with my own name on it, which was pretty cool um, for a couple of years after I won the Australian Open in 82. They made my racket for a couple of years and uh, Rosigmore was making rackets in the States um in vermont actually of all places so um it was kind of an interesting history of that but uh yeah i, have, I was very fortunate i had a uh, had my own clothing at one stage with lecoq sportif funny enough a lot of french companies uh, 
I was very involved with a lot of French companies and some Italian companies. Pretty awesome. Johan, now we're going to try to uh, get you to reveal your secrets on, you know, on the serve. So I guess I kind of want to start with, obviously, you know, the fundamentals in the beginning. So for the grip for you, uh, you know, what grip uh, did you pretty much use for your serve? And did that ever evolve or change with different types of serves or anything like that? You know, I, uh, I have a very strong eastern backhand grip. It was a spinnier grip but because I was very strong on my arms. I was pretty well. My dad was a rugby player. I was just genetically blessed with very strong body. You know, I would muscle the ball a lot. I mean, I could just hit laid back hands and flick things. And so uh, I, I found that if I wanted to hit very hard and swing as hard as I could, if I had a super carnal grip, almost like an Eastern forehand almost type of thing, like Boris Becker almost so with a forehand grip, um, I couldn't really... I couldn't control it as much. And so over time, I just learned to have a little bit more of a one-handed backhand grip, almost like an Eastern backhand, and just literally absolutely destroyed the ball. And I could just turn my wrist a little bit flatter if I wanted to make the ball go flatter. So that's kind of how I played. I was, uh, I had just enough cup to hit it, you know, way over 100 miles an hour every time. And my second serves were probably between, I would say, 95 and 105, 107 miles an hour second serves back in the day. So, um, you know, if you hit it close to the line, it's still a very tough serve to return. But um, I, I didn't really mess around with my grips too much. Um, I think one of the things that really messed me up was when I went from like a Rossignol racket to a Yonex racket, for instance. All the companies have different grips. Yeah, Head makes a very flat grip. Uh, Wilson makes more of a round grip. Yeah. So, you know, when I got to be pretty finicky with my grips at around the earlier 80s, 84 or so, after I started to do really well, I realized that Warren Bosworth was the guru guy at the time for customizing rackets, and he lived in Boca Raton, Florida. So he would make, he asked me one time, in fact, I think myself and Lendl were the first guys that really got into this technology of having your rackets identical. And uh, so I would have all my rackets sent to Bosworth, and he He'd actually asked me to make some comments on the grips or whatever I wanted to, you know, send me your rackets and tell me what you think of this one, what is that one. And I would just put a paper piece around the grip and put a rubber band it and made some notes. He couldn't believe how accurate I was by just feeling the racket. I could be a gram off in terms of height and feel it with my hand. So we were very, very f- finicky with our, with our feel of the racket, the weight, and obviously the size and the shape of the grip. Some rackets I would get from a factory, I couldn't hit a ball with it. And then the guy goes, yeah, the grip was completely off two millimeters too much to the right. So the head was a little bit shaped differently when you hit the ball. So just little things like that, you know. So that's why the guys are pretty accurate nowadays uh, with uh, the customization of their rackets. It's a, it's an absolute must. Yeah, it's really incredible how much it affects uh, you guys at that level of the game. Um, and so, you know, you mentioned, uh, obviously, that you use sort of a Eastern backhand grip on your serve, which is uh, great to show that, you know, there's different ways to, to do things and you can still be very successful. But for most of your students, do you, is there like a, a grip that you personally recommend to them um, on the serve? Yeah, I would. I would say there's a regular continental grip is pretty much a very safe bet to go with. Uh, if I see a kid shows up in my academy, you know, uh, not every kid starts with me. I mean, then I'll just be a beginner and a, and a customization type of coach for uh, for up and coming players. Take 20 years to develop it. And a lot of kids come to me and they're already pretty well developed, uh, have their own types of uh, styles and so forth. So when I see genius, I leave it alone. You know, I'm not going to, if, if a Nadal or a Celes or a, or a Santoro type of player shows up at my front door, I'm actually enjoyed it. I enjoy those types of players because you don't see so many of them. It's so few that you see it so rare. And by dexterous people, and you know, I, I find it kind of the spice of tennis life, if you will. Um, but I, I would say, you know, I, I play middle of the road for my regular kids, pretty much Carnell grips on serves. If I find that the girls don't really feel that they get enough spin on the ball, then I may make a tweak and change it to a two millimeter over so it feels a bit more spinny for them. Um, and that's about it. But I, I, I play pretty much middle of the ground with the grips on the surf. Gotcha, yeah. Johan. And so apologies in case I get this wrong for some reason, but when, when I was watching old videos of you, I think, you know, for the stance part of it, uh, you would you have had a pinpoint stance, and I think you might have brought your fe- uh, foot across. But I was just wondering, kind of your thoughts overall on on the stance of the serve. Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously, you know, guys like a Mackin are completely stood sideways, and, and you know, he just had his own way of serving, which turned out to be one of the best ways ever of that era. Um, 
but uh, for me, yeah, sometimes I think, you know, if, if you look at anyone's career, I think if you look at the young Federer at 18, 19 and how he plays when he was 25 and when he played when he was 30 and now he's 36, 35, I think you'll see that the things do change over time. And whether you like it or not, things do change. And uh, I think from my from my perspective, I think I ended up just by sheer not paying attention because I really didn't. I, I, I didn't really. I was more of a sensei player. When I when I mean by that is I feel the ball. I feel the way I play. I was very very. I was very I was very observant and I was very uh, in tune with what's going on around me and what's going on with the with the opponent. So I was more of a sensei player versus a abstract player looking at my feet oh i gotta stand two centimeters this way and then my i'm not that type of player i'm a complete field player and so what happened with my right foot i never really planted it next to my left foot i kind of almost slid it in front of my left toe so i was kind of like weird stance but i could i you know i was i felt all right and uh, no coach ever told me hey you know kind of looks funky you know <laughs> you gotta be maybe different so i just kind of kept it going but you know over time if i look at my surf now you know even when i was in my 30s i mean i probably was a bit more cleaned up at the bottom end of things gotcha yeah and that's great insight there and so you know with, with the motion obviously you see a, a, a wide variety you see the abbreviated you see the classic i'm just wondering in general you know what type of uh, motion you prefer and you know does that change depending on the level of the player and their development you know the serve is like uh the serve is like a fingerprint honestly i am a, i'm a very good coach when it comes to the serve because i had such a big serve for a little guy i'm more of a classic guy i'm a little bit more of a, of a classic salute type of server um you know there are so many varieties and so many ways that people hit the ball hard it's really at the point of contact i mean it's almost the same in golf you know you have a tiger woods for instance who when he swings his golf club on a driver i mean it looks like he's going to come out of his shoes and you have a guy like freddie couples or you have a guy like ernie else uh, who looks uh, you know no one they call them the big easy these guys look like they're on vacation they barely swing the club but yet they have a 109 mile an hour club head speed at the, the point of contact and then you have like a jim fury or you have a uh, you know a, a lee trevino from way back and these guys you know they were very sensei players i mean jim fury looks like he's spaghetti in his arm i mean the club head is all over the place but then by the time he hits it it squares off and he hits it perfect you know so the serve is very much the same i mean obviously uh you know, Nadal has, for a lefty, actually had improved his surf tremendously since 2007 in the last, I would say, 10 years. I mean, uh, his serve was not good when he first came on a tour, even though he was winning a lot. He was such a physical specimen, but his serve was really kind of a liability almost. Um, but he got away with it because he could spin it and he's a lefty and, you know, you don't play lefties all the time. You play lefties once in a while. So he got away with it, but I think he knew that eventually people will be on to that serve. And uh, so he had obviously, with Uncle Tony, made some changes to his serve. A guy like a Roger Federer is a very clean action, sort of more traditional maybe. Um, he's got uh, unbelievable smooth technique and timing, and uh, he's a sensei player too. I think Federer is a, you know, he could go away for a year and come back and still play the same, you know. Whereas in Nadal, he'd probably go to the insane asylum first, get his head straight out, go out and play 10 hours a day for six months straight, and then he'll be back. Um, so, yeah, everybody's different, you know. Um, tennis players are just uh, it's like fingerprints, man. The service, you know, the grips are changing. I mean, if you look at the French guys, you know, they have a their system, I think, of coaching, which I think is great. I think the French system is to kind of freelance the guys. You know, they give them a lot of freedom. All right, excellent stuff from Grand Slam champ Johan Creek um, on some great serve secrets from the pros. And now let's go to a lot of great advice from Taylor Dent on how to hit a 149 miles per hour serve. Let's see if you can replicate that. So uh, let's roll Taylor's clip right now. You gave us some amazing advice on the volleys, so I, I can't help but ask you <laughs> about the serve. And this is kind of a silly, maybe a silly question, but... Taylor, what is the secret to hitting a 149 mile per hour serve? <laughs> um, well, I think there's a lot. I, I think there's a lot that goes into it. I mean, obviously, you know, I, I don't know if if, if the, the term kinetic chain is, is correct, but it, it's more or less correct. You know what I mean? You need to be firing your body parts in the right order. I would say the most, and this is where I will disagree with, with, uh, kind of the common thought is I don't think the legs are a huge deal for increasing speed. You know, now for creating spin on the ball, they are a massive deal. Um, but for creating speed, not so much. The shoulder turn, like think about like a baseball pitcher. 
you know, when when they've got a runner on first and their their back is is to first base, they don't have the luxury of that big shoulder turn. You know what I mean? So they just do a little quick one, and because of that, the quality of the pitches deteriorate. Right? When the, when there's no runners on and he doesn't have to worry about somebody stealing the base. You see this huge, massive shoulder turn. Why is that? They're loading up for that power. So I'd say that's a big one. Another power killer that I see is when people, um, they get in their trophy position right before they're about to explode, and the the energy on their elbow is already uh, spent. And what I mean by that is, is the hand is already laid back on the wrong side of the elbow. Like if you, if you, you know, think about having your palm down and then shooting that elbow forward and that starts that throwing motion, it's more, you know, throwing and hitting a serve is more about the elbow coming, you know, forward in the throw or up and forward for a serve rather than the hand going backwards. You can't have the hand going backwards. It actually kind of stays in the same area as the elbow comes forward. So that one is a big one that I see all the time. People bring the hand backwards and it just kills the elbows whippiness. The other thing mm-hmm. is, you know, the wrist snap. Um, everybody snaps their wrist. You know, you, you can slow-mo everybody. It's like a forehand. You know, everybody snaps their wrist. The timing of when that wrist snap happens, though, is everything. So if, if it's happening during contact or after contact, you're losing out on a ton of racket at speed. It's actually how you have to start that wrist snap before contact even happens. Um, one fun thing I do with the kids, I have them – you know, swing and serve in the air without hitting a, hitting a ball. And I ask them to swing as fast as they can so I can hear the strings, make the strings real loud, you know, let's, let's hear them whoosh through the air. And then after they're swinging hard, I say, okay, so where, and this is cool, you can do this, you can do this yourself, where in the air are they the loudest? And you can definitely hear where they are. And most of the time, it's like eye level in front of them, straight in front of them. I'm like, well, that's funny. That's not where you want them to be fast. You want the strings to be fast above your head. You know, because that's where contact is. And so, you know, the, that's kind of one little trick to, to feel how early that wrist snap has to happen. So if you get a good shoulder turn, if you get that elbow firing in pretty fast and, and the, the wrist snapping on time, I mean, you're on your way to hitting a real, real big serve. Um, yeah, so I, I think those are the three, the three biggest ones for sure. Awesome. Thank you for that, Taylor. Uh, great tips there. I had a, uh, or I have a, an audience question from Laith who, who asked, and I, I know you just gave us some drills, but he asked, what exercises did you do to increase your serve speed? Um, I think it's personality. A lot of it's personality. You know, I, I can remember when I started playing tennis, my dad was <clears throat> uh, working with Michael Chang, mm-hmm. and all I wanted to do was hit my serve harder than Michael Chang. You know, I'm like, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm 10, 11 years old, so I didn't care if it hit the back fence. You know, it was it was going faster, and that's all that matters. I mean, another example of that was, is, is an adult's forehand. You know, I can remember watching an adult practice when he was younger. He was hitting his forehand so big, it was scary. I'd say 50% went in the back fence on the fly. You know, so it's just, I think, just going, if you want to generate some racket head speed, go out there, practice some serves, and don't try to hit them in. You know, that that's the, that's the worst thing you could do if you're you're trying to develop speed, because we're trying to push past what your body can handle. So just be reckless, hit them big, hit them fast. And obviously, obviously warm up, don't hurt yourself, but that's how you build speed is you, you, you overclock it, you overtrain it. You know what I mean? You go a little bit past what you can handle and then you do that enough and those miles per hour start, start creeping up. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. I mean, uh, obviously a lot of players, you know, their, their goal is to just get it in and there's no way that you're going to generate much, much pace if you're trying to do that. Um, at any point were you also doing like any sort of like gym exercises with the intent to increase your serve speed? Was that ever a thing for you? No. Um, the only thing that I did is when I was younger, I had some rotator cuff issues that kept me out for a little bit. Mm. So, I was pretty good about doing bands for my shoulder um, quite a bit. Uh, but other than that, I mean, everything, you know, a lot of power in tennis, because you can see some big weightlifters out there not really hit the ball super hard, right? And then, and then you can see someone like mm-hmm. Federer, who's not really a big guy. I mean, he's 6'2", and he's 175 pounds, and he can hit his forehand insanely hard. You know, it's huge. So a lot of power, and same thing in golf, right? Because we have a tool, a lot of power is generated from the whippiness and the elasticity. So everything that I did 
um, to get stronger and bigger was all about my legs, lower body, upper body was just trying to stay injury free. Great stuff from former pro and current coach Taylor Dent. Really enjoyed that interview with Taylor. And now let's go to some really excellent advice on the serve, uh, including the biggest mistakes and the importance of variety on your serve with coach Greg Lasour from Online Tennis Instruction. So Greg, uh, as far as the serve, just a couple of questions about the serve, and we'll try to get to some uh, audience questions too. But a similar question to the volley, which is um, if you had to pick one part of the serve, or maybe even a couple of parts if you'd like, that you have found throughout all of your coaching of uh, many, many thousands of players probably by now uh, that they commonly have uh, issues with, what part of or parts of that stroke would it be? Yeah, Mervyn, um, you know, it's interesting when you, you know, it comes down to the serve, you know, you, there, there are four, four aspects to it. I mean, you got the grip, you have the swing, you have the body, and you have the toss. But just kind of overall, you know, looking at at the at the arm action, you know, that's where you actually generate the most power. Although everything's involved from the ground up, you know, the body and so forth. But you know, I, I don't know how many serve we reviewed online. I mean, it's it's in the thousands, and people have worked with in live instruction. You know, where people really, which way I got to move here, <laughs> where where people really lose it is the beginning. Um, and, you know, it's so counterintuitive because it, with the serve, the only time your string is going to point, you know, at the ball is literally at the last second as you swing up and pronate. <laughs> Other than that, your strings are, are, are pointing away from the ball. And I think it's really hard to get your head around that. It just doesn't make sense. And, you know, when we start playing tennis, it's easy. Just toss the ball up and tap it in. So, um, you know, we start to advance our serve, but it's still in there. It's still programmed. So I think that what I find, if we can get players to what we say, begin the serve right, we talk about our right to left, where the racket moves you know, from the right side of your body over your head. Notice how the strings are angled slightly down. Okay, it's better for your shoulder. It keeps your shoulder looser. And it drops behind your back to the left. That sets you up to what we call the racket drop, where the racket points all the way down as a line with the right side of the body. All right? And really, it comes from that racket drop comes from being loose. We're starting, all, starting the right to left correctly, excuse me, being loose and then driving your legs. But I find this is what gets people because what happens is most people will turn the palm up, get in this open racket face. So now if everyone just tries this at home, it tightens your shoulder. Oh, hurts. And Exactly. So it could lead to, lead to injury. Plus it makes it very difficult to you know, supinate and you know, externally rotate to be you know, real technical. Um, it makes it difficult to do that. And maybe I've seen one person who could do this and get the racket drop. Um, I don't know what it did to their shoulder, but most people cannot optimize it. Um, so they either do this or they, they, they swing their arms back. They go out and around. Now the racket comes in this way. <laughs> and then they lose the ability to, to drop the racket. So I find that you know the, one, that's probably one of the biggest things I see um, if you can get the racket moving from right to left and then just relax and let the racket fall as far as your arm action goes, you know, that kind of sets you, sets you down the, the road to developing a good serve. And then, you know, just, and then also the understanding that I have at the last second, that's when I'm going to pronate. Um, I mean, that's probably the most common thing. I mean, we can get into other things about ball toss grips and, 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 and people opening up too early. But as far as the arm action goes, I would say that's probably the, the part that if people could work on, it's that beginning, that right to left. Make it simple. Go slow in the beginning. Just bend from the elbow. Let it bring it, bring it over your head slightly, should I say, <laughs> and just let it drop behind your back. Love it. Thanks a lot for that. That's fantastic, Greg. Um, so I see a couple of questions here. I apologize. I have to go in reverse this because I want to keep it on the serve first with Jay's sure. question. And I'll go back to Gary's. Um, but so uh, uh, Jay says or asks, how do you get more pace on a kick serve besides let the ball drop, stay more sideways, swing along the baseline or toss in the baseline? Any other tips or progressions? Thanks. Yeah, Jay. Um, yeah, that's that's a good question. Yeah, I think a lot of times people hit a kick serve. It's more of an American twist where they 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 toss the ball too far back behind them and they arch their back. 
So now you don't get any body rotation. Number one, it's not good for you, for your back or your shoulder, but you don't get a, a lot of body rotation and plus the ball's behind you. So, you know, when it comes to the kick serve, the understanding that it's, it's like your, your regular serve with some adaptations. So you're still going to have, you know, that racket drop, but um, you, you want to make sure your body's turning rather than arching. So, you know, you're going to get the, the uncoiling from the ground up. So it's going to help you with power. Now, when you are learning the kick serve, your toss, we say it's kind of more in line with your head, but still slightly in front. So it's not behind you and it's not too far to the left if you're right-handed. But as you get more and more proficient at swinging you know, up and out, you can start to get the toss further into the court. Now, the problem is, is that if we do that too early on, the people end up over-rotating too much. And then they end up almost hitting more of a slice because the, the swing goes into the court. So you want to make sure that you're tossing in the right place. So it's, it's in line with your head, slightly in front. Make sure you're rotating your body, not arching. Um, you know, provide you have a good racket drop. Once you can do all those things, you want to toss further into the court, but still stay sideways. Because when you're further into the court, and, and you can do this when we get off the court, you can take your racket and, and, and swing fast. And the swish is going to happen in front of you. So if you contact the ball behind you, your racket's not, not, not fully accelerated when you hit the ball. So you hit the ball, ball's gone, the acceleration happens after, afterwards, and it's not translated into the hit. So, you know, those are the things I, I would look at. And the other thing to keep in mind, you know, if you look at, you know, the speed, comparing a first serve on the men's tour to a second serve, a first serve on the ladies' tour to a second serve, on average is about a 20 mile an hour difference. So, you know, if you're serving at one, if you're serving at you know, average 115, you're at 95. If you're serving 100, your average is 80. Now, if you're working on your serve, you can imagine that that um, disparity is going to be much greater until, you know, you get proficient with the second serve, then you start to get more pace in it. But you are going to have a lot less pace on that second serve. Love it. Thanks for that, Greg. Just dropping knowledge bombs here. Um, <laughs> I appreciate it. hope it's not too much. <laughs> no, no, it's great. I mean, and yeah, that's a great point, you know, for everybody watching is to obviously, you know, when you're listening, try to figure out, okay, what one or two points, uh, you know, that I want to focus on and then uh, black out some time to, to train that. So, um, so let's see, my friend Victor here asks, um, so my best and most consistent serve on the do side is out wide. So should I go T or body, say, 50% of the time regardless? Um, you know, it all depends on your opponent. And I think as you go up levels, your opponent will start to pick up tendencies. Um, you know, and they start to lean one way. And they maybe even start to cheat over a little bit. So, you know, I always think of it more like a game of cat and mouse. I grew up playing cricket. You know, you got a bowler, you got a batsman, you got a pitcher, you got a hitter in baseball. And you're trying to keep them guessing. So if you have one serve, you know, once you get to a good opponent, they're going to pick up on that. And if you if you got that good wide serve to the deuce court, my my um, assumption is is that you probably struggle to hit down the tee. So then your opponent can stand all the way over to the right, and then they can pretty much pick up all your serves. So I would say, you know, I would work on being able to hit the ball down the tee. Because that way you can spread your opponent where he cannot guess. So what you do is you pull him out wide, you get him leaning that way. Now he leaves you an opening. Now you can you know, bang it down the tee. Now he doesn't know where to stand. Now, now you, you're playing this constant game of cat and mouse. So I would say you want to be able to hit that, you know, that flatter tee serve and the wide serve. But at the same time, you know, the body serve, it's, it's so underutilized, especially – Especially in, you know, in club tennis, you know, most players don't know how to get out of the way. So, you know, if your opponent is swinging out um, offensively, you want to jam and go right at him. But just to summarize, I would I would try to be able to hit, you know, both corners. And that way, you have options, and then you can kind of mess with your opponent. You know, and that's kind of where the fun is. You're trying to get him guessing one way or the other, and you may be able to pull some more aces out the bag. Excellent stuff from Coach Greg Lasour. Really. Also enjoyed my talk with Greg, another fantastic coach who's been on my tennis summits and definitely will be having him back if he would like to come. So, all right, now let's go to the final clip of this episode on serve killers from yours truly. 
So let's now roll this final clip, and I hope you enjoy it. Serve killer number four is a bad or non-existent racket drop. And as I have mentioned previously, this is one of the biggest things that I have seen in amateur players, and it's almost like a correlation for me as to you know the the worse the racket drop or like the the more shallow the racket drop the worse the serve the person has um so you know what's going to happen is if you don't have a, a racket drop you're not going to get any spin on the ball or even you know, very little and you definitely won't get as much power on the ball for sure i mean just like you know go to youtube and click the gear button and then click on point 25 or half speed um, when you're watching like a video of any pro player serving and you're going to see a really nice racket drop and then do the same with amateurs or just watch them and you'll see like no racket drop. And so, um, you know, obviously with this, uh, with this problem, there's several solutions that you can have. And you know, the first one that worked for me because I noticed the lack of racket drop in my, uh, serve, uh, at one point, what you want to do is just start the racket at the racket drop position, you know, because that way you're going to get a feel for the racket drop itself. Um, so you just want the, you know, have the racket kind of uh, droop down, you know, behind your back even, and then just brush up on the ball. And then you're going to, your arm is going to get used to getting that position. And then after that, progress to having the racket at the trophy position and then drop the racket. And so you don't really have to Go through the whole motion for this. Just simply put your racket, uh, your dominant hand up with your racket at the trophy position. Um, keep your arm loose and then really be aware of the racket drop. And then, uh, you know, practice many of these. You want, you want to practice like a ton of these two, um, starting with the racket drop position to hitting and then uh, racket at trophy position and then drop the racket and hit. Uh, many of those first. And then, you know, once you do your full uh, uh, serve motion, then you'll really feel that racket drop. Um, believe me, that's what I did. <laughs> and also, you really want to have a loose arm. Um, you know, if you have a tight arm, you won't be able to have a very good racket drop. You know, just try to stay relaxed, you know, take a couple of deep breaths, meditate before you serve, whatever it takes. And uh, just try to relieve the tension uh, out of your, your arm. Your, at least your dominant arm anyway, really both. And then that's going to help. And also I found if I'm properly loading on my back foot, that's going to help me kind of get more of that um, that backward lean that you need to propel yourself forward. And I'm going to talk about that a bit more in the next serve killer. Uh, also another one is to practice throwing a football with a friend uh, or by yourself, whatever works. And when you do that, like if you throw the ball um, the football properly and you, you see the rotation, um, that's a byproduct of a, a correct um, throw, really. And, and like you're going to have the racket drop or, if, you know, the football will drop, uh, you know, if you're I mean, you need that in order to throw it properly. So just trust me, just throw a football around and, and you'll and, you know, get that spiral going. And then, you know, when you serve, that's going to you're going to improve your serve as well. And the racket drop. All right, so fifth serve killer is bad weight distribution. Really what this means to me and what I saw with myself and others is, you know, your weight is on the front foot too early. And so when I was serving before, I would actually feel, you know, once I tossed the ball, had the racket in the trophy position, like most of my weight would actually be on my front foot. And if you think about it, you know, how can you pro propel forward um, you know, powerfully like with that, if you see like, uh, pitchers or even f people who throw the football, uh, people, <laughs> athletes, um, they're going to load on their back foot first and then throw. And I, you know, I really have to give a lot of credit to uh, Mark Kovacs and also Will Hamilton. They actually had a great course called the hundred mile power club and of which I am a proud member. <laughs> and so basically what Mark uh, was telling Will is that um, you want to practice your serves on your back foot. So this is, you know, getting into the solution here. You know, actually, like, let's say if you're a right-hander, you know, you want to lift your left foot up, and then that way all your weight is going to be on your back foot. And then you just want to, you know, hit a normal serve. And what you're going to be forced to do is load on your back foot, obviously, because your your front foot is up. 
And then, you know, at the point of impact, you're actually going to shift your weight forward. And trust me, you know, I was actually able to hit harder serves doing this than like my normal motion. And that's obviously because, you know, you're loading on the back foot. And uh, Mark likes to say that, you know, the serve is actually more uh, akin to shot putting. So you're loading back and down and then you're exploding uh, up and forward. And so when you proceed with the serve like that, you know, when you practice the serve on the back foot, that's going to really help. So I love doing that. Like sometimes I'll um, notice my my weight distribution being off and like I'm not loading on my back foot. So I'll do like 10 or 20 or, or more, you know, serves on the back foot and then I'll go back to serving normal and I'll get that load, uh, that weight distribution load properly. And also another way to think about it is just to think to yourself, you know, as you're you're getting to your power position, think majority of weight on back foot. So that's a lot of help. You know, I'm telling myself like, oh, 80% or so, just so like I, I'm I'm really uh, loading up like I need to. And, you know, that works for me. It's worked for a lot of others. So there you go with that one. And also you want to practice the power position too because a lot of people have a bad power position. This is almost like a serve killer in itself. Um, like if you're, if you freeze the trophy position for a lot of players, like they're not where they should be. They're either like leaning too far forward or their racket face is not in the proper position or their arm is like in a weird position, like, you know, stuff like that. So you want to really have a strong power position, um, you know, where you're loaded and your weight is back and your body is turned. So then, you know, you can uncoil, um, and really smack that ball or, you know, produce a ton of spin. And another solution um, with that, I mean, you just want to remember, actually, it's not quite a solution, but you want to finish on your your non-dominant foot um, because a lot of people, like, when they're serving and then they load and then they hit, they're actually um, landing on the same, on their back foot, which is not the way to do it. I mean, you see that in, like, older style serves, but... Um, you know, you want to load on your back foot and then explode up, uh, shift the weight forward and then land on your non-dominant foot, your front foot. All right. Surf killer number seis. That's six in Spanish. If you didn't know, thank you, Duolingo, um, <laughs> is to, is if you're opening up too early and if you open up too early, you use a lot, lose a lot of power and there's really no way you can hit a topspin serve. You, I mean, you could hit a slice. Okay. But um, you can't hit a topspin serve. So what I mean is like, let's say, you know, you coil properly, whatever, but then you open up your hips, you know, way before impact, um, then you're losing a lot of power. Um, and you can actually feel this, you know, how you should be coiling and uncoiling if you um, use a medicine ball and do some of those throws, it's going to really force you to coil and uncoil and especially for ground strokes. But anyway, Basically, what you want to do um, as a solution for this is to keep your tossing up arm longer because if you do that, you're going to keep yourself in the trophy position um, for as long as possible and then you'll explode up into the ball, you know, when it's really time to do so because a lot of people like it goes hand in hand that they open their hips up and drop their tossing arm too early. Um, the second solution here is, I mean, it's kind of obvious, but keep coiled, keep your body coiled as long as possible. Um, that way you won't open up early. So um, just try to try to remember, keep coiled. And for kick and top spin, you really want to actually stay sideways as long as you can because your your um, follow through and finish in, you know, is going to be sideways as well um, in most cases. So Stay sideways as long as you can through the swing because that way you'll really be able to brush up into the ball and hit that top spin and kick. So those are the three solutions for opening opening up too early. I think really the most important is to just be cognizant, like recognize this problem and then try to fix it, obviously. All right. If you're still with me, I really do hope that you enjoyed all these serve clips and I really do think they really unleashed a lot of great advice on the biggest mistakes we're making and 
you know, the biggest power sources and how we can fix our flaws on our surf technique, which I mean, as you can see, even some of the best players in the world, they, they had uh, serve leaks, uh, if you want to call them that. Um, you know, you, you hearken back to Novak Djokovic being number three in the world and still having like this somewhat funky looking serve. So, um, you know, you can still be a great player if you have technical flaws, but um, you are leaving some uh, on the table. You know, obviously, I think with Novak fixing his serve, that is a pretty big reason why he is at the top of the game right now. Um, but just to let you know, if you haven't realized it yet, um, you can check out all of these episodes, the entire interviews, which I highly recommend and, and episodes in my case. So uh, for Dr. Kovacs, you can go to tennisfiles.com slash 81, uh, Rick Macy, tennisfiles.com slash 98, Johan Creek, tennisfiles.com slash 89, Taylor Dent, tennisfiles.com slash 128, Greg Lesur, tennisfiles.com slash 150, and finally, the episode on serve killers from yours truly, tennisfiles.com slash 62. And you can just alternatively go to your podcast app and then look up these episodes on there according to the numbers that I just mentioned. Um, and and yeah, so I'll have all the links to, to each of these episodes as well in the uh, show notes page or, you know, they'll be in, in the notes within your podcast app. Alrighty then. Well, uh, yeah, this was a, a really fun episode and I hope you enjoyed it. And I just want to leave you with a quote as I often do at the end of the show. And this one is by Napoleon Hill. And he said, if you cannot do great things, do small things in a great way. And, you know, if you, well, the, the rest of this is my explanation, but if you do small things in a great way, then eventually you great things will come from those small actions that you do over and over again. You know, you practice your volleys uh, consistently, um, little by little, and then all of a sudden, boom, you have fantastic volleys So and so forth with the serve. Probably should have mentioned that instead of volleys, but you get the point. But yeah, all righty. Uh, and also, I would really appreciate it if you would subscribe to the Tennis Vols podcast if you are not already subscribed to the show and it would help the show, but more importantly, uh, it would automatically download all the episodes straight to the podcast app that you're using so you don't have to fiddle around with the app and try to search each of my episodes. You can just have them on automatically, which is the beauty of technology and subscriptions. Free in this case. Okay, well, thank you again for tuning in and I look forward to bringing you some uh, more great content to help you improve your tennis game. Of course, that is my passion and I'm glad that you are passionate about the sport of tennis, the great sport, the greatest in the world, in my opinion, and hope you're enjoying the French Open as well. Um, it's a really insane matches there. So, okay, have a fantastic day, week, month, and year, and we will see you on the next episode of the Tennis Files podcast. Take care. Mm-hmm.